remote monitoring and management hijackings don't lose control. And optimizing your MSSP support desk. That and the latest news and trends in the managed security space coming right up on Cyber for Hire. Building bridges between managed security providers and their clients, it's the podcast where MSPs, VCSOs, and end users take a united stand against cybercrime. This is Cyber for Hire. Chasing false positives, battling alert fatigue, finding the proverbial needle in a haystack. It all leads to cybersecurity staff burnout and increased security risk. Check out Managed XDR from NetSury. NetSurian's OpenXDR platform unifies your telemetry for wider attack surface coverage, deeper threat detection, and ultimately faster incident response. And NetSurian SOC empowers your team by doing the heavy lifting with continuous monitoring, proactive threat hunting, and guided remediation. Looking for a true partner instead of another vendor? Visit msspalert.com slash NetSurian. All right, welcome, welcome to episode number 10 of Cyber for Hire. How's everybody doing today? I'm Bradley Barth with SC Media in New York, and joining me today on the other side of the Continental Divide in snowy Utah is my co-host and partner in cybercrime, Ryan Morris, principal consultant with Morris Management Partners. Uh, welcome, Ryan. This is the first time without a guest on our program, so... You're going to have to do the heavy lifting today. I hope you ate your Wheaties. I, well, I've been eating Wheaties, taking cold medicine, taking uh, supplements, getting ready. You know, you got to do your calisthenics before. And then after the calisthenics, I needed to take a nap because, as you might hear, I'm, I'm, I'm fighting off the classic winter cold that I haven't had in three years, and, 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 uh, and I need to practice that. All right. Well, you sound good to me, Ryan. That's the good news Excellent. there. So uh, we'll power through today. Uh, plenty to cover today, as always. Uh, but some news is just so important that it can't wait, which is why we want to share with everyone what's top of mind today. So here's your headline. GDS Holdings and ST Telemedia Global Data Centers, both Asia-based data centers used by major global corporations, were targeted in a series of data exfiltration attacks since as far back as 2021, according to reports from ReSecurity and Bloomberg. Reportedly, in one case, initial access was gained via a vulnerable help desk or ticket management module that was integrated with other systems, allowing for lateral movement. And uh, The uh, actors involved had access to things like customer records, customer and data center staff credentials, and even a list of CCTV cameras and linked video stream identifiers used to monitor the data center environments. Ryan, explain why this is top of mind for you today. You know, this one jumps to the top of the stack for me. The thousand headlines, this one really caught me because it hits literally four different macro trends that we've been tracking here on our conversations that I know are very top of mind for the industry. Number one, the risk of third party uh, partners that we use inside our technology infrastructure. These are obviously separate physical entities and they are remote from the business operations of most of their customers. Uh, they are significant, they are substantial, but they still have these kinds of concerns that need to be monitored and certified that they are being taken care of. As an MSSP, you are probably using multiple of these kinds of third-party resources in your practice area, and these are where we've been noting the majority of risks coming from in recent news and, and trends in the industry. The second major one that I noticed is the idea of physical versus cybersecurity, or let's say that a little differently, physical plus cybersecurity, right? Because uh, if people get physical access to your technology infrastructure, little flash drive here, a little SD card there, a little bit of uh, cable uh, splicing, and it's amazing what kind of vulnerabilities we can introduce to a cyber environment. Uh, it is never safe to assume that just because you have all of the walls built up on the digital side, that that means your physical side infrastructure is, uh, is equally safe. And as we start to put these things in the cloud, in a remote knock or sock into a third party hosting environment, we need to really start paying attention to that physical security question. The third one that I talked to, that, that I really jumped on me is the cyber vulnerabilities of the installed base of AV networks and equipment. 
That is something that's been around for a very long time. There are cameras everywhere, uh, inside buildings, outside buildings, in, in municipal networks, in private networks. These cameras are everywhere. Very many of them are an afterthought when it comes to the uh, the cybersecurity protocols uh, because they're they're just a static device and they're they're a video input but they're not necessarily always managed as though they are an endpoint on the network and therefore with an IP connection vulnerable for penetration. That's definitely something that we need to redouble our efforts on. And, and then the fourth one, finally, you mentioned it in the in the lead up. As far back as 2021 was when these vulnerabilities and the actual penetration was exploited, and then folks have been hanging out in the systems ever since then. That's not okay, right? Like, A, these are the kinds of things that we think, oh, that third party, they took care of them a long time ago, and we think, hey, my system has been upgraded, certified, actively managed and monitored for the last several years. Of course, I'm fine. Uh, there might be some surprises lying in wait for us in our networks that go back multiple years before somebody decides to actually utilize the exploit that they've installed. So uh, this is definitely one of those kinds of stories that makes us wake up and say, we've got multiple uh, vectors of vulnerability here. We really need to be paying attention to all of them. And when they stack, boy, that becomes even more challenging for the end user. All right. Uh, excellent take as always, Ryan. Uh, you encapsulated four major issues in a very short amount of time. Great summation for us. That's our top of mind hot take for the day. More news later in the show. But first, it's time for our featured InfoSec news and trends topic, presenting our big idea in security. Remote monitoring and management hijackings don't lose control. In late January, CISA, the NSA, and the MSISAC released a joint advisory warning about the malicious use of legitimate remote monitoring and management software after uncovering illegal hacking activity on two federal civilian executive branch networks. Uh, whether compromised through social engineering or through exploits, uh, RMM tools can grant unauthorized users potentially unfettered access to MSP clients. And so the question must be asked, are you using RMM responsibly? And that's what we're going to talk about today, Ryan. A couple of episodes ago, uh, this uh, joint advisory was a, a top of mind headline. I'm not going to have you sort of reiterate your thoughts there. Uh, if you if you want to talk a little bit again about your uh, philosophy or or your your reaction to the joint advisory, uh, certainly I think that'll uh, kind of come up as we answer some of these other questions. But what I want to ask you first, uh, Ryan, is um, you know how is RMM typically compromised? Uh, you know what are some of the vectors that uh, today's adversaries are most commonly using, and what protections? against those vectors can maybe lower the odds of that happening. You, you know, it's, uh, this, this is a big topic. And, and as we mentioned when we touched on this briefly in a previous episode, it warrants a much deeper examination because this is striking at the heart of who we are as MSPs in the industry, right? The very foundation of our business model, the way that we do what we do and what makes us different from an in-house IT department, RMM, literally the R in, in that acronym is what makes us who we are in 99.9% .9 of our business relationships. That means we need to pay attention. But the fact that this is a joint advisory coming from such significant national global type of organizations, all we can say literally is welcome to prime time. Right. The, I remember the good old days, quote unquote, of being in the managed services business 20 plus years ago when we were using almost exclusively homegrown tools. Right. We would write protocols. We would use network scripts. We would dial into our customers systems and provide essentially the same kinds of services that we do today, but not using standardized platforms. We grew up when we got standardized tools. We deployed these things all over our operations. 
And if you think about all the flavors of MSP, you know, there's, it's very tough to get anybody in the industry to agree on a core definition of what are the attributes that quote unquote qualify you as an MSP. I think the one most universal tool that we all use is an RMM. We live, unfortunately, in a post solar winds hack world. And I'm not calling them out specifically because they are a, a source of ongoing vulnerability. In fact, the reporting that we've seen through MSSP Alert, through the SC Weekly Media family, we've seen some very impressive developments going on in their response to that attack. But every single one of us lives in a world today where we know this stuff is vulnerable just like literally every other tool that lives in our technology stack. And so we need to be paying attention to this. To the core of your first question, as you talk about how it's usually compromised, there, there are what I perceive to be three layers, right? There's the source code layer, which is uh, a vendor or supplier type co question or conversation. There is the deployment and maintenance level at the MSP implementation. And then there is, as always, the human level. I believe from the research that we've been doing here that the vast majority of successful penetrations of RMM come through category three right? You, me, our peers who do this stuff for a living, social engineering, uh, accidental breach, internal hacking and vulnerabilities. That's where we get the vast majority of all RMM penetrations. And, and here's a scary thought for you. The significant majority of these kinds of compromises that are happening at the tools levels are not universal in scope. Right. Uh, and, and this is a little counterintuitive. So let's kind of think about that for a second. The bad news about the solar winds hack and some others that have happened in the RMM space, it, it affected quote unquote everybody. Right now, we know that there were only a certain limited number of specified penetrations and exploits that, that took advantage of that. But everybody in the world was aware of it. Everybody in the world needed to do something to change their implementation and their behavior because of it. And that was tough, right? It, it, one penetration affecting everybody, we all wake up and we remember these things in legend. But it's ironically even more dangerous when the exploit on RMM is individual, right? When yours is fine and mine is not, the industry doesn't write a headline about that. We're not gonna all know about it instantly and then deploy a proven remediation to take care of that thing. When it happens here and there in isolated incidents, almost all of us still think, hey, my RMM is cool, it's fine, and I don't need to do anything about it. These tools are the lifeblood connection to our customers. I think that they deserve more attention and frequency for scrutiny than literally everything else in our technology stack. Yeah, interesting, Ryan. And the use of legitimate tools like RMM is commonly known as living off the land. And those type of techniques where uh, a malicious actor is misusing a legitimate tool are among the most difficult techniques to spot because it's camouflaged as what could be very legitimate uh, business activity. Now, if there's a phishing scam type case, like a help desk scam, where they're basically asking the victimized users to download um, some RMM solution or software that typically the company doesn't use, that would hopefully set up a red flag like, hey, this isn't the RMM solution that we typically use. And there probably should be some awareness about that. Uh, if they are able to actually compromise the RMM solution that the company normally does use, that's even trickier because it can really be disguised as legitimate activity. Are there certain subtle red flags that you can at least identify uh, when a scenario like that takes place? Absolutely. And, and you're right. I, I personally believe that of all the folks I've ever worked with in the industry who do this on a daily basis, right? The people who live in the alert stream and the people who are responsible for maintaining the uh, the integrity of response when when something bad actually happens 
the, the one thing I've learned from all of them over the years is that a blatant malicious attack, right? Something that is designed to go from cause and effect immediately into an exploit. Those are surprisingly easy to identify and respond to. They're aberrant in terms of their code. They they deploy a certain process or uh, or, or some automated uh, procedure in our software that's immediately flaggable. Those things, they're direct attacks, but eh, you know what? That's kind of what we do for a living. And so we're actually fairly good at identifying those. These things that appear to be otherwise normal, that's where we get ourselves into hot water because people appear to be friendly. They appear to be doing the same things that we always do. In this particular case, the worst example that I've ever heard where a healthcare organization on the end user side was penetrated via their MSP's RMM tools. The the exploit actually took months to deploy. And in hindsight, as they as they did the postmortem on this situation, what they found was that for the first two or three months that they that the bad actor was in the system, they mirrored exactly what the legitimate actors were doing. Time of day topic of messaging that came through, the, the right cadence and frequency of messaging that came through, they, they mirrored exactly the behavior of what a good guy would have been using that legitimate tool to do. And then as soon as they had gained a certain amount of trust and just became part of the environment, that's when they started deploying things that were a little bit out of control. The best we've heard in terms of identification is there has to be a regular approach to scrutiny and review of these tools, right? Making sure that messages that went out came from a trusted source, that they went through a trusted protocol, and that they actually returned to that same trusted source in any type of, uh, of, of automated ping and response type activity. Uh, that's not something you can identify in your regular reporting. It needs to be tested. It needs to be verified on a regular cadence. I understand everybody's busy. I know we got a thousand alerts coming per day per agent, so it gets really tough to carve out resources to go out and do the additional layer of testing. But that's exactly what I'm suggesting, right? That there needs to be an in-house SWAT team type of an activity that goes on on a regular basis to ensure that we know what's happening in our tools environment. Uh, These things can be identified and flagged and we can communicate through regular channels to our users and to our admins. They need to know that testing is a regular part of the environment, but we also need to be doing that testing so that we can verify only good guys have gained access to the system. In addition to the monitoring and the scrutiny of these solutions and the usage of them, are there other policies or configurations you can potentially implement to mitigate or limit limit the damage? I mean, I know a lot of these solutions, the, really the idea is uh, to let the services provider fully take over the user's computer. But can you possibly, in, in certain instances, implement certain restrictions that at least uh, prohibit um, the person that's taking over the device from, uh, you know, from basically executing certain actions or maybe moving laterally uh, or, or maybe require one extra step of, uh, of, of verification or approval beforehand? What are options there, Ryan? You, you know, it's, it's a great look at it, right? Because... There are technical things we can do, and then there are human things, right? If you go back to our three sources of where the potential vulnerabilities come from, things like zero trust applied into our internal tools environment, I think that makes sense. Pardon me. That makes sense from a configuration and a, and a rules and policy access point of view, right? I personally think that the world is easier when every admin has an open access to every user's computer. And I also think that is completely unacceptable from a configuration point of view. Uh, Ease of use is not the defined uh, attribute that we're looking for here. It is the robustness of the security that we need to do. By definition, what that means on a technical side, admin 
rights and related capabilities of their tool sets, the RMMs uh, that we're talking about need to be as limited as possible. We begin with absolute zero access to user or client devices, and we open only the capabilities that are absolutely required to provide the services that are necessary. Uh, in, in one case, right, we were, we were doing some shadowing with an MSP who was using an RMM tool to reconfigure a system uh, for a an end user it was an end user outside of the IT department and it required them to do something to the customer's system. Now it's easiest and it's most convenient for the admin as well as for that non-IT person that was being affected to just install that stuff one time, right? The remote access capabilities that I'm talking about in particular. It took a few minutes, get this thing downloaded, get it set up, and then use it to make the change to the system that needed to be made that was identified through the RMM uh, protocols. At the end of the call, the user said, hey, can we just leave this thing installed on my machine? I don't want to have to go through that every single time something needs to be done to my machine so we can just use that. And it was kind of tough for that IT professional to say to the executive user, non-IT professional, no, that's not acceptable because then it just leaves the back door open that anybody else could come through at, at a future date. It wasn't popular. There was some legit pushback from that executive who said, you know, come on, man, convenience is what I need from you people. Can you not just get your job done a little bit easier without being so disruptive? And the answer is disruption is the only defense to automated attacks through these kinds of systems. So by definition, no, that's not okay. And we need to be very keen to set those policies and to be willing to, even when they're not popular, enforce those policies. But on the other side of the table, right, when it comes to the human side, boy, it's amazing to me how old some of the credentials are for former employees that used to work at an MSP who, you know, they left and they went on to a new job. They were a good guy. They they moved on and, and, and they got a new career opportunity. But months years, literally multiple years later, their credentials are still deployed on the system because we don't use them and we had a thousand things to do. And hey, we're all good guys in here on the team. We need to just, you know, move on and deal with the more urgent burning topics. Not cool. That's that's definitely an area just that's one example of many that we need to be paying attention to on the side of human administration and, and, and just making sure that policies that are convenient do not trump policies that are actually secure. Yeah, and for sure, uh, I agree. And, you know, speaking of the human element, uh, really uh, another advisable idea also would to be consider incorporating um, RMM and policies surrounding it uh, into your security awareness training so that users do understand scenarios like this person is asking me to download an RMM software right now to get access to my computer. Just take a pause and step back for a minute and think about whether or not uh, this is actually a good idea. Does this fall within the protocols uh, of my company? And that's certainly something uh, to think about as well. Uh, Ryan, I also wanted to ask you, you know, in the top of mind example, that I just gave you uh, before leading off the show, uh, the malicious hackers of the data centers, uh, they also tried to access a feature provided by the data centers to enable customers to manage their servers remotely and troubleshoot them remotely, almost an inverse of uh, the kind of RMM we've been talking about here, where the user is given remote access to the service provider also equally dangerous in its own way, I would imagine, Ryan. Oh, yeah, <laughs> literally. And think about the multiplier factor there, right? I'm one end user that wants to go into an environment just to manage my own stuff. So give me access to control my servers through your system. Uh, then you have what was the, the data in the story indicated that there were 2,000 organizations that were affected by this kind of a thing. Uh, one actor through the MSP to 2,000 organization, big bad situation. 
one user back into the service provider as a co habitant with all of the other 1,999 organizations, equally dangerous environment. And, and, and this is the thing, right? I was talking with a, a friend who, who works at one of the RMM vendors uh, and that I've known for years and years. I was talking to him recently about this specific scenario and about the vulnerability that we introduce. And, and he said, listen, in the old days, it was we called them RMM tools, but the vast majority of deployments, he, he said it, it was more accurate to go with an acronym that was actually more like RM slash M, right? Where we did remote monitoring, and then when it was necessary, prudent, and effective, we would bolt on the management, the actual remediation capability, right? There is, to my thinking, still a tremendous amount of value to be had through remote monitoring and active alert system capabilities. Just to know what's going on in your environment, that's a good thing, right? It makes us all more effective and we can start whatever protocols are triggered by a, by a scenario in, in a radically faster time period. So that's always a good thing. But that doesn't mean that in a modern environment, every single deployment also needs the second M, right? We, we need to be paying attention to only privileged users and trusted resources can and should have access to uh, the uh, ability to affect a system that is connected th through the monitoring capabilities. Uh, we still see a lot of MSPs who make money, who have a deployable service that is strictly attached to the monitoring and alerting capabilities, and then it is a higher tier of service and, uh, and intensity associated with the second M, with the management capabilities. I, I kind of think that as an industry, we need to not get a little too... Uh, it, you know, enamored with our own tools and capabilities and just assume everything that can be automated is automated and every feature that could be deployed is switched on for every single customer and every single user inside of a customer. Your question triggers exactly the justification for that line of thinking. Yeah, and in fact, I might even take it back, uh, maybe not even equally dangerous, more dangerous because of the multiplier factor that you just mentioned in this scenario we were talking about. Uh, so last question, Ryan, uh, if you're an MSSP uh, and uh, or, or you're a, a user or a potential uh, client of an MSSP uh, that wants to use RMM, uh, how do I decide if RMM is, is worth uh, the risk? Um, knowing, uh, obviously, the conveniences associated with it, but the dangers associated with it, how do I decide if RMM is for me and I have the risk tolerance for it? You know, Bradley, that's a great question because I think it's one of those situations where what is old is new again. Uh, there, there once was a time where remote capabilities, remote access to client environments, that was the shiny new object and capability of the industry. We were fascinated with the fact that we did not need to be on-prem in order to administer our customers' systems. Uh, that led to the literal evolution of the business model where we could eliminate drive time, windshield time. We could provide services for many more customers per agent that we used to be able to deliver. It, it created a nonlinear scalability for our business model. And as a result, we were like, woohoo, let's deploy this thing everywhere. And it becomes a de facto expectation of the managed environment. Fast forward uh, 15 years or so into a much different cybersecurity climate than was present back then. And I think we need to go back and reconsider whether remote access is justified. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting that we turn off remote capabilities. I'm a business person just like the rest of us, and I recognize that nonlinear financial scalability and the dramatic improvement it makes to the business model. I'm just suggesting that we need to do a formal risk-reward analysis for each of our clients as we go through this process. I'm going to stretch that logic just a little bit and say, 
whether you are the MSSP or whether you are the client of that MSSP, this evaluation needs to be done in both directions, risk versus reward. The reward, like you said, I think we can make a bullet list that's 30 or 40 items long about the technical, financial, and operational advantages of doing much of what we do from a remote perspective. That puts the pressure back on the risk side. Can you justify all of those benefits by mitigating the risks as much as possible? I think it means that we need to start saying, listen, we have a defined policy that is applied across all of our technologies to ensure the regular testing and validation of our internal stack of technologies. If you are a client and your your provider cannot show you documentation, application, testing, verification for their internal security capabilities, uh, you should probably find a different security provider. If you are the service provider in that environment and you can show the documentation and the regular testing and, and validation for customer confidence, I think that, that that ought to be a badge of honor. That ought to be a competitive opportunity for you to win in the marketplace. So uh, we, we need to take that stuff seriously. But there are other mitigation factors as well. And my answer is, you know, that that good housekeeping seal of approval that that we all took for granted after decades and decades in not only the consumer products environment, but also eventually into the consumer electronics environment. We need that kind of rigor applied to the tools that we introduce into our customers' environments. Just because it's easy to deploy RMM uh, does not mean that it ought to be a de facto standard. As a service provider, we need to earn that right to access our, our customers' systems as a trusted actor. And that's not a one-time activity that requires perpetual testing and validation. Anyway, guys, that is the big topic that Bradley and I wanted to talk with you guys about today. I am absolutely convinced that very many of you out there will have thoughts on this subject. It's central to what you do. How do you justify RMM to your clients? How do you validate the security of, of your systems internally? We would love to hear back from you guys on this. So please uh, reach out to us via our show page and via our email address, uh, cyber4hire at cyberriskalliance.com. Please let us know what you guys think about this topic and let's keep that conversation going. But for now, what we're going to do is shift out of our big idea on security and into a fun segment that we like to call We Speak Geek. We Speak Geek in a very interesting shift for today's conversation because we don't have a guest on who we would normally be interviewing on this topic. It's Bradley and I, and so uh, what that means is that we are going to show you guys a little bit of a peek behind the geek screen that uh, that keeps the two of us ticking here. So, uh, uh, Bradley, um, let me start with you. How do you speak geek in your world? I mean, I speak geek in a lot of different ways, so I'm just going to pick one for today. And, you know, I've been, for better or for worse, and mostly it's been for worse, uh, a New York Mets fan for my uh, entire life. Uh, big baseball fan. I've been to probably something along the lines of maybe a, a dozen or so uh, stadiums, uh, Major League Baseball stadiums across America. Uh, how do you make baseball geeky? Uh, you do by scoring the games, and I like to keep score. Uh, people definitely have their own personal systems for how to do it with all sorts of little lines and scribbles and you know, little notes and asterisks to you know basically do it exactly the way you want to do it. And I have, uh, over the years, perfected my system, and I'm still always making little tweaks. And so I brought a couple of my favorite all-time scorecards now, this one was actually from 2012. Uh, I had attended a Seattle Mariners game in Seattle. I, was, uh, I, I, was, I lived in Seattle, but this wasn't when I was living there. I was visiting folks, and we decided on a whim to go to Safeco Field. First time ever there. 
Felix Hernandez pitched his perfect game that day. Nice. So I got to attend a perfect game against the Devil Rays. And so here I've got my little scorecard from that. I made a little notation saying, you know, perfect game uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the notes of the game. So that's one of my favorites uh, that I cherish. I also have a Mets scorecard, Diamondbacks versus Mets. This dates back to 2007. I didn't score this one. This one was scored by the late, great Bill Shannon, uh, who was the official scorer for the Mets and the Yankees. And I had gotten a chance to interview him uh, as a sports reporter. Uh, and uh, we talked a little bit about scoring the game. And then uh, he let me keep his scorecard uh, for the game that we, uh, you know, basically sat together talking. And so very cool. And again, I, I will always hold on to this. And, you know, his he's got... You know, a different style than mine. His is definitely a little more, um, you know, messy. Uh, but uh, we, we, you know, again, it's that's the cool thing is that everybody does it a little bit differently. So that's that's how I speak geek in terms of baseball. See, now that is that that is you. I have heard for very many years that those of us in the technology industry are predisposed to enjoy baseball because of the analytical factor of the game, right? Everybody who's a baseball fan of any depth knows that there's more advanced analytics, more statistics, more predictive capability from the individual through the team, through the game scenario, right? There's more of that in baseball than literally any other sport, and therefore we geeks tend to gravitate towards baseball for that reason. Um, but I got to say, uh, the participation factor that you get out of not just watching a game, but living it, uh, you know, the, the power of the printing press, as they say, was that we could take an individual experience and transmit it to the rest of the world via the written word in mass production. I think scoring a baseball game does exactly that. I would say that, uh, that, that perfect game scorecard that you have there, shadow box framing like it should up be lighting museum type uh type, type felt background that is a keepsake for the generations that is awesome yeah i agree with you on that i gotta get to that all right i'm gonna flip it on you now not that you can top this you can't but i mean i'm sorry but but uh <laughs> i want to ask you now ryan how do you speak geek I will tell you, mine's not nearly as interesting to the outside world as yours is. And like you said, it's one of very many geeky things that I do. But it is something that I think over the years has kind of uh, defined the practical side of my life. Uh, I am a student of battery technology. Now, before everybody yawns and turns off, uh, le let me just assure you, that was born from a physics and a chemistry perspective, much more than it was from a technology battery pack perspective, right? Uh, from, from a very young age, I was fascinated with how batteries work. You know, you get those little kits that you can do as a kid. You can solder things, make your own radio, make your own battery. Uh, from a very, very young age, fascinated with that technology. Fast forward all of these years into the industry, and I am continually interested in the way that this not only advances as a technology, but also the implications that it has on literally everything we do in technology. Uh, many years ago, worked with a, a number of the, the big vendor providers that do uh, UPS systems and then data center power and cooling systems and all of the infrastructure. And they, they reminded me, you know, you could have the best server network storage data center set up in the entire world. You could have the most powerful business application logic deployed in your environment, the most advanced analytics. And if the power goes out, uh, it's pretty much just some really fancy paperweights, right? And mm -hmm. I, I internalized that many years ago, so I continue to be a, a follower of that. And as you can imagine, as we move into an EV world, uh, this is becoming far less geeky and far more you and me driving down the road and having range anxiety kinds of questions, <laughs> right? But it translates in a really geeky way into what I will admit is an unhealthy number of individual battery 
devices that I have, right? Uh, I'm one of those collectors. You know, some people, they collect knives and other people, they collect baseball cards. Uh, I unfortunately collect battery packs, right? Uh, there's some of them standard format, right? Never leave the house with my backpack without having more than one of those in there, especially when you're traveling distances. Some of them are 5K. Some of them are 10K. In the milliamps calculation, I have one that's 20. I have one that's 20. That's solar powered, literally, right here, and I'll show it to you. It's, uh, it, it, it's, it's my connection to the outside world that says, as soon as you turn it to the light, it, it will remind you, you could do what we do off-grid, so I aspire to that at some point in the future. But they also come in a very weird little configurations like this one here it is actually, you know one of the byproducts of a portable battery pack is heat, right? It's the reason they tell us don't pack that in your suitcase, in your checked luggage, because it might start a fire. You know, some of us harness that on purpose, and this one is actually intentionally a battery device, but also it, all the insulation is taken out of it so that it works like a hand warmer. Oh, and when you go outside cool. and it's 15 <laughs> degrees outside, you just take your portable battery with you and people think, he's not a nerd, he's well prepared. Right? <laughs> and, 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 you know, I have others that are flashlights that also include the, the window breaking thing and the seat belt cutter so that you can, uh, the, the, you can uh, be safe in your car and also recharge your, your phone when you're traveling. That's only a tiny little sampling of yeah, the things that I have. I, I will say, uh, for those of you who are not battery nerds, it's remarkable how much this one technology is about to affect literally everything we do. Your car, your house, your technology, your job, your communication capabilities. Um, uh, the grid is not a permanent solution. Plugging into the wall is some ancient, unreliable, and unsecure technology that, uh, that we will evolve in the next several years. We will introduce renewables. We will introduce all of these other technologies. And it all comes down to the, the chemical reactions and cell wall per permeability as how we transfer ions and, and such inside of these, these devices. I'm a nerd. I'm just going to say in five years, all y'all are also going to be battery nerds, because if you're not, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> I mean, I got to say, very unique collection. Don't know anybody else that's ever collected batteries. Got to ask you, at least before we wrap this up, did you ever make one of those, uh, you know, potato batteries that could, you know, run an alarm clock? Absolutely, right? Potato batteries were fascinating because, again, this is how you bring the old world into the new world. That one is fun, but there are also multiple technologies for creating batteries at home. Now, uh, in a future world when, you know, if all the things hit the fan and all the technology goes away and we find ourselves in, in The Last of Us or the post-apocalyptic world that we're dealing with out there, I don't possess many manual labor skills, but I do possess the ability to build electricity from nature. So I might be somebody who gets to not get voted off the island a little <laughs> bit longer than my manual skills would suggest. All right. Well, I'll make a mental note of that. If we get overrun by zombies, you're the first person I'm going to seek out. And uh, much like the Energizer Bunny, we could keep going and going and going on this conversation, uh, but we can't because we have to move on to the second half of our show. So we're going to wrap up the first half here, but please come back for part two, which will feature our business and industry topic of the week, optimizing your MSSP support desk. Uh, that plus our InfoSec News Rundown and our Dear Cyber for Hire Advice column segment. All that coming up, so we'll see you in a moment on the other side.